Okay, I wasn't quite sure how this is all going to work, but I'm happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about this. Thank you for the introduction. Um, not sure there's too much more to add other than um, it's starting to get fall and cold like here, and I'm wearing long sleeves for the first time in quite uh, a few months. So it's uh, it's, it's all it's all changing and getting exciting, and before long we're all going to be heading up to the slope. So it's uh, exciting times indeed. <clears throat> all right, so it's time to rethink test ops. We'll. Um, and you probably have some definition of what test ops is in your head, and we're gonna we're gonna challenge that a little bit. We'll see how this goes. Um, but I'll first start with what is test ops and and how do we define it. Secondly, we'll talk about this as a framework for scaling test automation. Oh, I might have just given you a little bit of a clue right there what this is. And then next, it's going to be tips for scaling test automation, and then some features to help you scale. So. Go through this progression, ask a question anytime you want, put it in the chat. I'll try to, to keep my eyes out for anything that new that comes in. Um, I can see them, there we go. And we'll get going. All right, so what is test ops? Everybody knows what test ops is, right? It's the, it's the intersection between testing and operations, isn't it? Well, that, that is a, a, a definition that I see out there in the interwebs quite a few quite often. And it's it's natural because you know we have DevOps, and that's the intersection between Dev and Ops. But if you think about what Dev and Ops has evolved to become, it's it's not just where these two teams intersect and have communications. It's now really been thought of more of as this infinity loop where people are thinking about how they you know build requirements, develop a product, test, um, you know, deploy that product and monitor out there in production, get feedback, gather that, turn that into the next set of requirements. So this, this loop includes testing and testing doesn't just even fit in that box. Testing can fit, you know, earlier in the cycle. It can fit later in the cycle into production. So, you know, this intersection doesn't really make a lot of sense. It doesn't help that much. Is it using production data in testing? Well, it is important to have good test data and it is important to, um, make sure that your data looks like uh, whatever data you're using for testing looks like the kind of data that is going to be used in production, but that doesn't really help the definition of test and operations, really. And the third thing that I see here is that sometimes test ops is talked about in terms of testing and production. Now, testing and production is an, an interesting and valid approach to testing your application. Um, I've done it at every software company I've at. Uh, I've been at is is it's part of a testing strategy that that you know you you release your software, um, maybe you you feature flag some of it and you release it to a subset of customers and you kind of get some feedback from that and then you start to release it. But it also has more applicability in these in these um, you know applications where you have lots and lots of users, so that you're not exposing the same group or or a big portion of your paying customers to potentially buggy software before you really get to test it. Um, or before you get feedback and then um, and then roll it out to others. So it, it has its relevance, but I still don't think it really helps too much. So let's talk about what we think it is here um, and the way we've kind of defined it. And I think it's a new and useful definition. So when we think about the challenges with scaling testing, so we start off and somebody starts a project and they have, <clears throat> maybe it's a one or two test automation people that are in charge of, the, of doing the testing. Maybe it's manual tests. Maybe it's um, you know you're starting some automation, but it always starts small. And, you know, maybe you only have a few um, <clears throat> uh, a few people, a few tests, and maybe you're not releasing software that quickly. Maybe it's still a little bit uh, not quite move into you know a continuous deployment scenario, and then you start to add people and you add tests and you add releases and. One thing I've learned, um, it doesn't matter what it is, but as you scale up the number of anything, it gets to be more complicated. So when you add more people to the testing team, even the, even if those people are all really highly knowledgeable, um, it, it just adds a level of complexity that's bigger than having fewer people. And just like when you add more tests to that process, you end up with um, a series of, hang on, I'm just gonna move this out. Okay, great. Um, when you add more people, more more tests, uh, now all of a sudden you have to start thinking about how how are this organized? You know, do I organize them by uh, user type? Do I organize them by a feature? Do I somehow um, take them and organize them also by the type of test that I'm going to run? A smoke test, a regression test, something else, a sanity test. And then you think about releases. The more releases I have, the faster things are turning. So I I, I think about you know not only do you have to build coverage of your existing application, but the faster that application is changing, 
the more it's impacting your existing test, as well as then creating a new need for a new test. So it's just adding this level of complexity. And the combination of these three things is, is why it, it just makes it hard for many people to scale their test automation. And part of the reason that all these three things are growing is um, number one, we are seeing web applications take a bigger uh, role. I mean, you used to have, you know, people would have their own application, uh, maybe it's a desktop application. And, and now web applications are, you know, growing, they're getting more functional. In fact, you're seeing a lot of people, even some are abandoning a, a separate mobile specific app rather than just going with a, a, um, uh, a web application that uses progressive technologies that you know renders well on a on a mobile phone as some people's primary strategy. Now that's not for everybody. Of course, there's reasons to have a mobile app, but it does it does minimize the amount of development you have to do if you only have to develop at one time a one application. Um, release cycles are getting faster, so people are adopting DevOps and, and more of the characteristics that actually make DevOps DevOps. So. You know, people have said they're doing DevOps, but what they really meant was, well, we have a conversation between dev and between operations, and yeah, we have some talks, and they kind of understand our configuration challenges that are going to happen when we get out there in production. We kind of understand what they're building. So that's not DevOps. DevOps is, is truly an integrated team and managing it across all that, and people are getting, you know, more and more close to what the true definition of whether it's DevOps or continuous delivery, those, those faster iteration type cycles. And then lastly, test automation is getting easier. Now, there might be some questions about that, but if you look back, you know, five, 10 years ago, you know, what, what did you have for, for options? You know, you had, you know, tools like, or uh, frameworks like Selenium, of course, um, you know, write things in scripts, you know, you had to have specific knowledge. How do you, how, you know, you have to know about Java, probably you have to know about you know, Selenium syntax, you know, there are certain things you know, and, and those are specific set of skills that somebody needs to hire for and all that. But, you know, a lot of new tools have come out and made things easier. Um, some of those tools, uh, you know, might be record and playback type base. Others are model-based application. You model the application and then, and then you know, use AI to, to kind of examine it. But regardless, they're, they're making test automation more accessible. They're also more feature-rich. If you look back at Selenium, you know, 10 years ago, nothing could really compare to it. And today, um, you know, almost every every vendor-based solution also has similar features that they can they can do, and a lot of times in a much simpler and automated way. So it's getting more accessible. And uh, my dog is standing by the door waiting to go out. So one second. <laughs> She only wants to, wants to leave when I lock the door. So um, there we go. So our definition of test ops is, uh, is think about it more like testing operations. So it's the operations of managing your testing portfolio. As that testing team gets larger, as you get more tests, as you start to scale faster and, and, and do more, you need, um, you need a team that can really manage that scale. And so we call it the dis discipline of managing and scaling test automation to maximize efficiency, delivery speed, and application quality. So one thing that's important there is efficiency. You can always add more people, but people cost money. And if you've had to hire anybody in the last, in the last uh, you know, 18 months, you find it's not that easy to hire people. Uh, there's a lot of competition out there for resources. And we think of it in, in these four core tenants. So, you know, breaking it down, you know, how do we describe it? Well, we think of it as, first of all, there's aspects of planning that come into testing operations. So if you're a, a quality person, you have to plan the testing that you're going to do. Uh, there's management. Management is about, you know, how do I organize tests? How do I manage my people? How do I manage the life cycle of a test? Control. How do I make sure that I um, am making changes to tests that are approved and, and of high quality and building high standards for my tests? And then insights, how do I uh, know more than just whether a test passed or failed, but how do I know whether quality is really there in that product? Am I improving quality over time? Are the team members contributing in a way that is, is um, you know, improving over time? And are there things that we can do to make things better? So we'll break each one of these down and go through them, and then we'll come into some other uh, more specific recommendations. So starting with planning. So we have to think about what to test, how to test, and then who should test it. So, you know, what to test could be things like, um, you know, what part of my application are, am I gonna start first? You know, you could think of a risk-based testing approach where you're focusing on, 
either something that is likely to break because it's first of a kind technology, or maybe it's it's some um, you know some technology that your team hasn't worked with a lot. You know, if you have a, an application that's been around for a while, you probably know where most of the bugs are. This is where the developers can really help. You know, pinpoint where we have the most problems, and it can can focus you on the things that are that you want to test first. That said, they might not be the easiest things to test. You know, they, they could be complicated testing scenarios. And so maybe you start with some things like you know, your happy paths, your most critical paths that are, are most critical. If, if we have a problem in this area, it's gonna really impact our customers or their customers. Um, how do you test it? So you know, we think of the testing, testing pyramid or testing triangle, however you wanna look at that. Um, most of the time I see it represented as a triangle, even though they call it a pyramid. I'll leave that alone. Um, but how do, how do we test it? Well, you know, you don't need to test it, um, you know, multiple times for everything, you know. So there are certainly, you can, you know, do your unit testing, of course. Um, do your integration tests. Integration tests are certainly more important when you think about, um, you know, the way we're building things today, you know, using uh, um, uh, containers. Boy, that was a hard word to get up using containers to you know, deploy software. So a lot of people are building things, microservices, and then integrating them. So your integration tests become more important. And then lastly is, is these end-to-end -end tests. And while end tests, end tests keep getting easier, it's not to the point where we're gonna start flipping or inverting the, the testing triangle upside down. We we'll probably have to think about you know, um, you know, still having a fewer number of integration, I mean, integration tests than unit tests and, and fewer number of end-to-end -end tests than integration tests. And then who should test it? So, you know, skills come into this and um, uh, time and, you know, all kinds of things that come in there. Of course, you want, you want to, you know, think about what are the outputs of the planning process? You know, so you have your, your planning documentation. Now, I will argue that, that um, documentation becomes a little less critical now as we move to more automated tests. So as we, as we were designing test cases before, and most of them were manual, you know, you needed some manual guidance. You needed those, you know, those uh, design specs. Now you still need design specs, but you can be, you know, this is our input, this is our output, this is what we expect to accomplish or what we need to test through the different, different, uh, um, you know, steps of a test. Um, we need to understand what our pass fail criteria are, you know, what are the kinds of data that we're going to, to make sure that we're testing, you know, those, those, uh, those main, you know, happy path cases, you know, does the login work when you when it's supposed to work, but also does the login fail when it's supposed to fail? And what happens when when you try, you know, goofy characters when you're trying to log in? Those kind of things that fit into your test data, you know, help you really have a, a more robust system. And then the related tests, you know, do we already have some tests? So, you know, at the beginning of your of your sprint, perhaps, you know, you say, hey, you know, I've talked with the, uh, the developers and the engineers have come together, of, of the quality engineers have come together, they've had a discussion and they say, you know, this is what the new feature does. And the quality engineers might say, hey, we've got some reusable components that we can pull in and we can, we can help test part of that. Or we have a, a test that, you know, gets you most of the way there. Let's leverage those, those reusable components and, and you know, build well-designed tests. All right. So... So management. So here, I like to think of it in terms of these four aspects. So test organization. You know, how do I organize my tests? You know, do I put, um, you know, do I do it by user? Is it by feature? Is it by, you know, by by a module within the product? And then, you know, how do I use things like labels to to create my smoke tests and my regression tests? So the combination of these two things is kind of like a matrix. You know, I have I have a login test for an admin that I might not want to run unless, you know, on every smoke test, but I have a login test for a typical user that I do want to run on every smoke test. So, you know, depending on your, on your scenario, you know, some of those tests will, will be very similar sounding and, and do similar things. And yet when you run them can be done through a label or through a suite that, that kind of bisects the things that are in those folders. Uh, work assignments. So one of the things that I, I found, um, has been really popular with, with our product is we, we've allowed them to have test owners assigned to products. And so that just that fact that somebody's name is associated with a test becomes really important. Not only is it somebody to go back to if something fails, but you know, it just, it just makes sure that everybody knows who's responsible for everything. And 
when, when I get into a little bit more, I'll show you that it also helps people identify what their key priorities are and how they relate that to an overall project and what are the things that need to be done in order to make sure that, that the release gets out the door and gets tested properly. Uh, the test life cycle. So a lot of people don't think about tests in this term or, or think about what a life cycle of a test is, but you know, you start and you write a test and maybe that test is just, it's just a stub. You know, I just say, I need a test for, you know, my login. I need to test for a search in an e-commerce app. I need a test for, um, you know, add to cart and I need a test for checkout. You know, those are four super high level, super simple descriptions of tests, but you haven't written them yet. Those are just drafts. And you start to build out those tests over time. And then you get to a point where, okay, I think this test is solid. It's ready to run. I'm going to go run it and I'm going to evaluate whether that test is ready. Um, and then you might, um, you know, if it's ready, you turn it to active, you run it active in your, in your system, in your CI. And then maybe it's failing for some reason that you don't know what it is. You don't have time to fix it. You want to quarantine that test. Or maybe it's at the end of its life. You know, we're not testing this, um, this module, but I still don't want to throw this test out. I'll just quarantine it. Thinking about tests in a life cycle from cradle to grave lets you, lets you also manage it, um, you know, so you don't have all these tests hanging around that really aren't adding any value. And, it, and, and you know, we run into customers all the time that have, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, really, of tests. And they might tell us that, hey, you know, 30 or 40% of these things are failing every day, and we don't even look at them because we don't even know what they do. Well, <laughs> they're not really serving you then. So, so perhaps you would put them into a quarantine state and see if, if you can just eliminate some of the noise and focus on what really matters. And then next is text, test execution. You know, how do you, how do you manage what and where uh, things get executed? When do they get executed? You know, do you do it on every commit? Do you do a uh, different kind of test on pull requests or, or release candidates or regression on a, on a scheduled basis? All those things are up for... Uh, you know, up for consideration in your testing strategy. Next, control. So control is about managing tests to high standards and making sure that they are, you know, of, of high quality, just like you manage your code. Code. Um, you want to make sure you're driving reuse and you're reusing those things because, you know, if you had code, you don't, cop you don't create copies of code. You instead use a method. Uh, you call that method. You know, you, 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 it just makes things a little cleaner. Um, and, and easier to maintain. And then uh, approvals, you know, so there are certain people in your organization that are going to know more about your testing assets and, you know, how to write good tests. And those people are a perfect candidate, those SMEs to help, to help make sure that you're only approving good tests into your system. And then insights. So insights is more than just the, the did a test pass or fail. It's, it's what did I learn from that test? So, you know, you want to analyze results. So you want that, that you know, historical data, you know, to see what the, the current trends are of your tests. You want to be able to understand what, what's happening with them and learn from them. And then ideally, you know, you're, if you're going to transform your business and continue to, to advance uh, the things that you're doing, um, that, means, that means that if you have a certain type of error that keeps recurring, you fix the underlying cause of that error rather than keep fixing the same errors over and over again. It's like, it's like fixing a leaky tire all the time. You just by pumping up the air, it doesn't really help you. You really need to patch that tire so that you're not spending a bunch of time fixing that tire. Um, and then reporting, of course, is really critical. You have to be able to report to management to show the progress that you're having. So these are all part of this insights. And there are things in each one of these categories that can help. So, so while I, I'm talking about test ops and, and I have test ops position as this, this really important thing you need to do, um, there are other things that I think are important. So we included some of them, uh, some of them here, lessons that we learned from our customers about project success and some of the tips that help ensure project success. So one of the things is when you're, when you're starting an automation project or, or you're, you know, you're, you're ready to, to make some you know, change is to have a blueprint for what the success is going to look like. And we always start with support structure. So, you know, have a strong champion, you know, have some engagement from management, have a communication plan. You know, every week we're going to communicate the results of this. Um, you know, we're going to get, uh, get this in front of everybody. And then, you know, infrastructure readiness, you have to make sure that all your, your assets are uh, ready. You know, perhaps you have a separate test environment. You have to have all that up and you don't want all those things taking you down later on. So, you know, you build your plan, you have a kickoff, and then as you go through it, you're going to have to prove your value. 
and demonstrate that the things that we're doing are actually adding success. You know, we're improving our success rates on our on our tests. We are um, able to keep up with new features. We are, uh, you know, integrating into the, the CI CD process so that those tests are kicked off on on CI on new builds. And so, you know, each one of these things is proving the value of your test automation team. And then when you get into the scaling part, this is where test ops comes in again, but, but, you know, establishing those change controls that I talked about, you know, making sure that as you expand into other team members, you know, developers start writing tests, that they're writing good quality tests and they're following a process, a naming convention, a folder placement, all those things that would help you manage well and, and help you, um, you know, ensure that you have high quality, all those things are being followed. And of course, measure and report. Measure and report is really uh, critical. You just, you know, you got to keep showing value and, and it helps, uh, you know, everybody feel like, hey, this is a successful project. I want to be involved in this quality project. A couple of other uh, tips, plan as a team, document. Um, one of the things that we have found is that, you know, especially when you're moving into the agile teams and you have different members with different skill sets is, you know, that, that initial meeting at the beginning of a sprint, you know, and then frequent check-ins can really, you know, shed a lot of light on, you know, what's going to be tested, how critical is this new feature that's being built, what are the other components of the application that are touched by this feature, and then, you know, you, then you look at the knowledge that is brought by the automation team, and they're like, okay, th we think this is the best way to write a test for this or to test it, we have these other assets, we've already created the shared object that can be reused that would help you build tests quicker. And regardless of who's writing the test, whether it's the developer or, or a QA person, you know, you've got better knowledge and, and now you can go build that test and understand the timelines that things have to be done in, in a much uh, better and faster way. Um, I mentioned we use components and, and why do we do that? Well, they're, they're, it makes them easier to maintain over time. So if you have a test that, uh, well, just say you have, you know, 10 tests that rely on the same uh, element within a page or the same particular testing component, you know, maybe you fill out a form and in order to, to do your testing, you have to get through that form to get to the next stage of your testing, you know, reuse the, a form fill type of step, you know, so you fill out that form in a couple of steps, save that as a group, reuse that across other tests that need to do that. Same with the login. And that just helps you um, if, if something changes in the form fill out you change it one time in that group and all the tests that are dependent on it now uh, you know, benefit from that one change that you make. So it just makes things faster. It makes them easier to maintain. It helps you share them across your team. Um, and then just one, one note here on uh, smart data use. So, you know, of, of course, there's lots of different ways that you can use. There's a whole, whole strategy about test data management and different ways. Um, all I'll say is, is when you go out, go about thinking about your, your test data is to think about it from not just what are we trying to test in this scenario, but what are the users and what are the different environments that I want to test it on? So you think of it in terms of these, of these um, different attributes. So, you know, one login test for, um, for an external customer, for an internal user or an admin, you know, could use three different sets of data. And when you think about that ahead of time, you're more likely to have a, a um, you know, a better data strategy. And then, of course, review and communicate results. I talked about this on the blueprint. And the important part here is, you know, to make sure that you are, are you know, setting expectations, you are communicating those results, and you are, um, you know, continuing to expand. With every success, you, you leverage that to go into new successes. I had a, um, you know, one of my colleagues in another place, he used to always say, you know, don't let a crisis go unleveraged. And you know, anytime there's a, a bug that that showed that got into production, that's an opportunity to you know to do something different or do something better in a way that that can improve your overall quality and, and improve processes over over time. And so, when you see those things, don't think of them as as a failure from the team. You know, confront them head on and think about how can we change our process in a way that handles these kind of things going forward. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some features that help with help you scale with test operations. Now, okay, this is the, the marketing person in me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the perspective of one vendor, but hopefully you'll, you'll see these features and see um, the usefulness of the features and, and we'll just let it go like that. So when, when I think of the testum solution, I think of there's 
this bottom layer of things that practitioners do every day, right? They, they author tests, they, they maintain tests, they have to troubleshoot tests when they fail. And, and those people might be QA people, they could be um, uh, developers, you know, they come in and write tests for the features. Those people sit at that layer. When we talk about test ops, now we're talking about a layer above that. So these are people who are in charge of the testing automation system. They are people in, you know, responsible for you know, that vendor's um, automation system. Maybe it's Selenium, they're responsible for that. They're responsible for the users and you know, the, the organization of the test. All those things sit above that layer. All right, I'll still stay in the product, but I'll not try to promote us as much. Um, all right, so we'll start with insight. So um, one of the things that's really important is that you have good visibility into you know, what is happening in your automation system. So, so here, depending on what kind of user are, you are, when you come into a dashboard, you should be able to identify what are the things that are important to me? What are the things that I need to work on? And if you're you know, a, a developer who maybe uses the test automation tool you know, once every two weeks when they're, when they're on their new feature, um, then you know, you're not gonna come into this tool very often. So you wanna know in a quick moment, what are, the, what are the things I need to focus on? So here you might come in and say, oh, you know, I have some, some tests that are in draft state and I have to finish those tests. Or I have some that are failing up in the upper right and I have to go address those failures. Or maybe, um, you know, probably not for a developer, but maybe for a QA automation engineer who's in here, they have some pull requests that they need to review. And a pull request would be, you know, a test that has a change that is pending a review that would approve it to get merged into the main set of, of tests, so the main branch of the test. And so making sure that you are uh, keeping up with your, your, with your approvals um, will help the rest of the team who relies on your approvals to move forward faster. So it helps identify where the bottlenecks are so that you can, you can uh, knock those bottlenecks down and, and address them quickly. Um, another thing is the test status. So I talked about this a little bit where, you know, you have different status of a test throughout its life cycle. So how do you think about it in terms of, you know, is it draft? Are we just writing a stub for it? Are we writing it now? Is it um, something you're evaluating to see if it's stable and ready to run? Uh, or is it active and it's, it's running in the CI and if that thing impacts this, if it, if it fails then it's going to stop the build? Or lastly is quarantine. Now, the, the most interesting uh, state of these is evaluating. So evaluating means that you can run it in the CI um, and it will give you a result and it'll tell you if that part of the application or that particular test you know, failed or passed, but it won't fail the build. So that's important if you have a test that you're maybe not quite sure if it's 100% stable, maybe sometimes it fails, sometimes it uh, fails for a, you know, a locator issue or can't find an element or, or something like that, but sometimes it does. So you, you run it, you kind of understand the results, you can improve it. This is also really great. One of our, our customers said they use this to um, for new developers who are using the tool, maybe they haven't quite figured out, you know, how to, to make a, a test sync up with the application perfectly. And so, you know, they're, they're doing a little bit of, um, you know, evaluating, they look at it, see what, what the last few results look like when it gets uh, to, you know, succeeding 70, 80% of the time, then they turn it into active. So lots of ways you can use this. You can also use it as a, as a, as a tool to say, you know, what are the things I need to work on? Do I have tests that are in evaluating stage that need to be looked at to see if they're ready to move to active? Do I have tests that are in draft state that are things I need to build for this uh, feature release? Or are there quarantine things that I wanna come back and check on later in between uh, feature releases that, that need to be improved? Next one is test owner. As I mentioned, you know, it's really important to be able to identify who wrote a test, but if you are the owner of that test, then you can see what's really important. If you go back to that dashboard earlier and look at tests owned by me, you can then see here are the things that I need to work on. I can look at the tests that are in draft status for me. I can look at the pull request for me. I can look at the, the, um, you know, the failures for my specific test. And it just, it just helps you understand well, what are the things that are, you know, that I need to get done first thing. So you're not like hunting and pecking or trying to figure out what's important or who knows what you're doing in order to triage. And the, the next one is just, you know, having a good way to organize your tests. So I mentioned that you might have, um, you know, folders that you put things into that you would, um, 
you know, maybe they're, they're by user or by a type of a part of the application or module. Um, but you also might have things that are very useful to other tests that were written for one test. And that could be, you know, a custom coded step that, that does something particularly useful. And you want to make that easily available. So not only do you put it in a place that people can find it, but you also make it really easy to add it into your test. So make it part of the application. You can go in and find it really quickly. You can add it into your application. Uh, I'm sorry, into your test. And all of a sudden, now you've got a step that has been tested in another part of the application that you can run in your test and hopefully saves you some time. Um, and then, you know, when you're merging these tests back in, it's important that you aren't just doing a, a copy paste. So, you know, you want to make sure that it's it's following things like Git and GitHub, you know, where, where you are actually comparing the differences in the code um, between, you know, what's in the current branch and what is being proposed to be merged into that branch. And you're comparing and saying, yes, this is a good change. This is not a good change. This one's a good change. And then you decide which ones you want to merge in. Um, you want to make sure that your tests are doing similar things, that you're looking at the test steps, you're looking at the tests that you want to merge back in. And it's not just this all or nothing type of copy over. So, you know, having that level of granularity is also really important. Um, and just as our pull request, so, <clears throat> you know, following the Git model, uh, GitHub model that you, that you see, you know, I'm, I'm, um, if you don't know about the pull request, hopefully most people have probably been exposed to that. I used to work at GitHub, so I, I, I'm a little bit familiar with them. Um, but it was, it was pretty foreign when I first got in, into that, that organization. Um, but, but they are, um, they're very useful, right? I have a pull request is essentially saying, I have some code that I want to merge back in. Will somebody please look at it and approve it? And it's similar in the test, right? I, I, I keep the master from being uh, something that's changeable. And then you, you, um, uh, you know, then you make changes uh, through the pull request process, which makes it really easy. And then, uh, and then you merge them back in as, as the pull request. So I guess this is kind of like the same slide. Um, another thing that's really important is to think about, you know, the, the, the cleanliness of your code. You know, are, are I, am I duplicating a lot of steps from across tests? Is there a way to identify them? Um, you know, in code, you could, you could refactor your code. In, in test automation, you know, you would have to have something in the tool to identify these things. But, you know, the more you can eliminate some of that duplicating uh, test steps and, and turn it into reusable code, you know, the more likely you are going to be to, to have, um, you know, cleaner code that's easier to maintain. And then lastly, I'll just wrap it up now. Uh, I, I realize this is kind of weird that you just kind of talk and talk and talk and then you're done. But, um, the new test ops is, is really, we think about it in terms of scaling your test, your, the operations of testing. And I'm, I talked about these four aspects of planning, management, control, and insights. And you know, if you think about how you manage complexity, it's really about, about you know, how do I do it? Not just with extra people. Extra people is, is, is easy, but hard to, to do, right? You're always pressed for time. And even small companies, right? And everybody can benefit from, from you know, minimizing that complexity. So test ops, it's not a substitute for other good project management things. You know, we talked about communication, we talked about um, planning and, you know, having good structure. Um, so it's not a substitute, but it is a nice, really a nice add-on to think about how do I manage my team and tests. And lastly, we'll just encourage you to look for, for features if you're looking for a new automation solution that help you scale your team and your tests more efficiently. So with that said, any questions? Or can we probably have a minute or two if we want? Yes, there's one question that came in. Um, so this is, what are the differences between test ops and DevOps for automation? That's the question. Um, so, yeah, it's an interesting question because the test ops and DevOps are, are you know, kind of similar sounding concepts. So uh, when I think of, of, of test ops, there's, you know, it started off with, with just basic collaboration. You know, the, the two teams need to work together. And the first iterations of test ops were basically taking somebody out of operations and putting them in development and saying, you know, you're a test or you're a DevOps person and you're responsible for making sure that we have good communication across these two organizations. And then, you know, the processes started to evolve and people started thinking about, well, how do I, you know, improve the handoffs? How do I move some of those things that happen in, you know, deployment and uh, later phases 
you know, how do I move that back into development? So, you know, you design for the configurations, you design for security that's going to happen in operation, and you, you build those things in. And you might even manage, you know, security and configurations in your Git repository. So you're, you're actually, you know, doing some of that stuff um, there. Uh, all that helps, you know, ensure that the code that you deploy that works in your dev environment, your test environment also works in your operating environment. And, and it kind of, you know, simplifies that transition. When I think about uh, test ops, the way we're defining test operations, it's more about, you know, it, so just, first of all, testing fits in there to, to begin with, right? Testing is part of the, of the DevOps cycle. So you go from, you know, you're, you're developing code, you're testing the code, you're deploying the code. It's already part of DevOps. When I think about where test ops is different is test ops is talking about how do I make this part of the infinity loop of DevOps, you know, scale and more efficient and, and how do I, how do I take days out of my, my whole loop cycle by, by making it, um, you know, more efficient. So, you know, how do I organize things better so people find their stuff? How do I make sure I'm not, you know, spending a bunch of time trying to troubleshoot tests that keep recurring and fail over and over again? You know, how do I eliminate the noise that causes a lot of friction and causes things to slow down? Cool. Uh, yeah, that, that was a great presentation with a lot of information out there. Um, I think it gives us a completely different perspective of test ops. Um, and yeah. I don't see any other questions coming in, but for those who want to interact, you could uh, definitely uh, use the virtual areas uh, further. So we will be breaking out for a tea afternoon tea break now, so you can network there. I put in the links uh, in the chat, but for those who joined late and probably don't have the links to up the survey, because we're conducting a survey, uh, we need you to put in your thoughts there. Uh, there's a virtual area as well. And also, yes, you can reach uh, to Sean. Uh, he just dropped his email as well. You can connect to him on LinkedIn or anywhere as well that would uh, give you answers for your questions. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, it was a lovely presentation. Sure.